let's start off kind of where we left off yesterday. I think, I hope you guys basically know what to expect by now. So I'll be talking about observations of protoplanetary disks again, but today I'll be focusing on the gas component of the disks, where most of the mass is located and what controls most of the dynamics in the disk. Um, so once again, I encourage you to interrupt me with questions. You guys asked a lot of good questions yesterday, so please continue to do that today. Um, a little bit of background to start off, why gas? Uh, I just mentioned it to you a little bit already, but first of all, I wanted to point out that 99% of the mass of a protoplanetary disk is in gas. If you don't have that number memorized before I leave, then I haven't done my job. Um, so. The interesting thing about this, though, is that most of that gas is actually invisible. And you heard about this in the previous talk a little bit. The, um, the reason is that molecular hydrogen is what composes most of the mass of the gas in a protoplanetary disk, and molecular hydrogen has no dipole moment. So that means various things for the chemistry of hydrogen in disks, but for observing disks, what that means is that you don't get dipole transitions, which are important for two reasons. One is that they're, they're very probable, they're more probable than quadrupole transitions, and the other is that they're excited at low temperatures in these disks. So you don't have to have uh, extremely excited material before you can produce quadrupole transitions. So most of the quadrupole emission that we observe from molecular hydrogen happens at, at much higher energies and therefore only in the very innermost regions of the disks. Whereas if you're looking for dipole transitions, you can see them even in the low temperature, low density regions in the outermost parts of the disk. So if you want to look at all of the gas in the disk, you need to find something that has a dipole transition that is excited at low temperatures and densities. And the molecule that best fits the bill is carbon monoxide. So it's, it's a, a carbon atom, I guess that would be the smaller one, attached to an oxygen atom. And because the two atoms have different masses, it has a dipole moment, so you see lots of dipole transitions. So carbon monoxide in protoplanetary disks is the next most abundant molecule after molecular hydrogen. So that's what most of the observations focus on. Um, now when I say it's the next most abundant molecule after molecular hydrogen, it is less abundant by a factor of 10 to the 4. So, um, so you're actually dialing the densities way down when you look at carbon monoxide, but there's still quite a lot of carbon monoxide in the disk to the extent that the disk is, uh, is optically thick in most of the carbon monoxide transitions. And I'll talk about that more later on. But Gas is important because it composes so much of the mass of the disk, but unfortunately the vast majority of that gas is invisible to us. So we look at proxies most of the time and carbon monoxide is our most powerful proxy. As I mentioned before, gas dominates the dynamics of the disk. So, um, so a lot of what I'll talk about today is the Keplerian rotation of the disk. I'll mention some things about gas drag, which is very important. Also turbulence in the disk I'll spend a bit of time discussing because that turns out to be extremely important for the formation of planets in the disk. Um, gas provides access to kinematics. So uh, with dust, of course, you get a lot of emission. It dominates the opacity of the disk, so it's relatively easy to see even though the mass is relatively low. But you can't tell how it moves, right? Because you need those gas lines to provide access to the, the Doppler shifts that give you kinematic information about what's happening in the disk. So I thought I would show you sort of a cartoonish version of what goes on, um, how we use gas lines and protoplanetary disks to tell us about the motion. So here I've, I've created a cartoon um, of the intensity as a function of velocity of a protoplanetary disk. So this double peaked structure is very typical for protoplanetary disks, and I'll explain why in a moment. Also, uh, in my talk today and also more generally as you, as you look at gas studies of circumstellar disks and molecular clouds as well, you'll probably see a lot of channel maps like this. So when we observe disks with radio telescopes and molecular lines, you can also do this in op at optical and infrared wavelengths with integral field units. You can create a position, position, velocity cube. So you get position and right ascension, position and declination, and you get velocity information as well. So in each of these channels, as a function of velocity across the line, we'll create an image of the material at that velocity. So what do we expect that to look like? Well, let's start off by thinking about the line wings. So first of all, the line center is here, and if the, if the star isn't moving relative to us, we would expect that to be at zero velocity. However, of course, most, most stars are moving relative to the sun, so there's some s systemic velocity associated with every star. Uh, for nearby star forming regions, that tends to be plus or minus a few kilometers per second, nothing huge. So 
uh, if we imagine that this is sort of zero velocity or the systemic velocity, what's going on with these high velocity line wings? Well, of course, you all know about Keplerian rotation, right? In Keplerian rotation, the outermost parts of the disk rotate orbit the slowest, right? And as you get closer to the star, material moves faster and faster and faster. Basics of Keplerian rotation. So the fastest moving stuff should be closest to the star. So when you look at a channel map out in the line wings, you would expect to see this high velocity material essentially centered on the position of the star. Now let's next talk about the line center where the velocity is equal to the systemic velocity of the star. If you imagine a circumstellar disk rotating in space, uh, some disks might rotate face on, you know, you, they might be in, inclined so that they're, they're oriented face on to the line of sight, but most of the time the disks will have some inclination to the line of sight. They'll, they'll be a little bit tilted towards or away from the observer. So if we imagine a slightly tilted protoplanetary disk orbiting in its, in its plane, in its uh, Keplerian plane, um, you can imagine that there are Doppler shifts coming from this disk, right? And the biggest Doppler shifts are coming from the outside edges where material is moving towards or away from you, but there are also regions where there's essentially no Doppler shift because the material is moving perpendicular to your line of sight, and that's the front and back of the disk, right? If you imagine this disk orbiting in space, it's the stuff that's moving this way, perpendicular to your line of sight, that exhibits zero Doppler shift from the, the red shifts and blue shifts from material moving towards or away from you. So uh, in the center of the disk, you would expect to see the front and back of the disk. So I'll actually just fill in the next two channels. So here's the front of the disk and the back of the disk as we think of this disk in space. So this is like the minor axis of the disk if you were looking at it on the sky. And now what's happening in the middle here? This is the brightest part, and that's because it covers the largest area. Um, this is the regions of intermediate velocity, where if you imagine your disk orbiting in space, it's not the stuff that's moving the, the fastest towards or away from you along the major axis, but it's the stuff that's sort of intermediate between the front and back of the disk and the edges. So it takes this butterfly wing shape that you see here, and because it covers a large area of the disk, a large area of the disk has these sort of intermediate velocities, that's why it has the, the most emission. That's why you see the peaks here. So, and then it's symmetric across the other side. So one side is red shifted and one side is blue shifted. And that's what you're seeing in this double peak structure. Does anyone have any questions about that? I know that that can take a while to process. Um, but when you see double peaked lines like this and channel maps, this is, this is sort of the velocity structure that you should look for in these circumstellar disks. Okay, and finally, why study circumstellar disk gas? Well, it provides access to chemistry. And chemistry is uh, confusing and complicated, but is ultimately important for understanding planet formation. So I'll talk a little bit about chemistry and its effects on planet formation later on today. Okay, the other thing to keep in mind when you're thinking about these observations of circumstellar disk gas is that disks are not homogeneous in terms of their gas. They have a layered structure. And this diagram that I made focuses on the carbon monoxide molecule, but other molecules will have similar layered structures. So once again, we have our star in the middle and we have our disk around here. And uh, this layered structure has basically three regions. One is the, the surface of the disk that's dominated by radiation chemistry. And where does that radiation come from? Well, it comes from essentially two sources, energetic starlight and cosmic rays that ionize and photodissociate material in the outermost layers of the disk. I'll get rid of those for a minute. So we don't see any uh, carbon monoxide or really any molecules at all in this uh, surface layer of the disk, essentially because they're photodissociated. We also don't see any carbon monoxide in the very center of the disk, and that's because how does this disk get heated? Well, it gets heated once again by light from the star and also a little bit by cosmic rays on the outside. And so the surface layers of the optically thick disk are gonna get really hot, but then that energy has to diffuse down into the center of the disk. And it doesn't do that with perfect efficiency. So the inner parts of the disk, if we were talking about an accretion disk around a black hole where things are relativistic and, um, and the viscosity can actually heat the interior of the disk, then the center of the disk might be hot. But the viscosity in these protoplanetary disks is not nearly high enough to provide energy to raise the temperatures up above maybe 10 or 20 Kelvin. So it can get very, very cold in the centers of these disks, and carbon monoxide then freezes out from its gaseous state to a solid state onto the grains. So there's actually sort of an intermediate layer here uh, that we think of as the warm molecular layer, where it's sort of the Goldilocks zone, right? It's, it's 
too cold to be photo dissociated and too hot to be frozen out. So that's where most of the carbon monoxide exists in these disks. So when you're looking at a particular line, you have to think about where in the disk it's coming from because different lines will tell you about different parts of the disk. So if you look over here, the CO rotational ladder, so if we just think about 12C, 16O in its different rotational levels, um, there's a, like I said, there's a lot of carbon monoxide in the disk, 10 to the minus four times the amount of H2, but there's a ton of H2, so there's still quite a lot of carbon monoxide, so it tends to be optically thick. So when you look at the CO rotational ladder, just the 12C, 16O uh, transitions, you're basically seeing the surface of that warm molecular layer because those transitions are optically thick. So you see sort of the upper and lower layers of the disk. And I'll show you some images later on that'll hopefully make that more clear. Um, there are ways to peer deeper into the disk, even by looking at carbon monoxide. You can look at isotopologues of carbon monoxide, like 13C16O 16 or um, 12C18O or something like that. So uh, as you go to these more rare species, because the, the number densities become lower, um, the optical depths also become proportionally lower and you can look deeper into the disk. So you can sort of peer, peer through the disk and sort of peel away pieces of the disk like, like an onion skin by choosing your tracers carefully. And then once CO gets frozen out onto grains in the midplane, uh, because of the various chemical reactions that you just heard about, um, deuterated species can sometimes become much more abundant. So actually you see more deuterated species towards the midplane once the CO has frozen out and no longer destroys the, the deuterated species as they form. So uh, the point here is just that when we look at these different lines um, in circumstellar disks, you have to think about what's it telling you about the disk structure. Is it telling you about the surface? Is it telling you about the interior? And you can choose different tracers for different purposes. When you say deuterated species, are you refer referring to Deuterium? Actually, um, so yeah, sense. deuterium. So in this case, uh, DCO plus is one molecule that is very abundant in the midplane once CO is right, frozen so out. basically deuterium combining with a CO. That's yeah, deuterated molecular species. So deuterium combined with other. All right, so. Yeah, and um, I'll, I'll also mention a little later on, deuterium is an incredibly powerful tracer for a number of reasons. Um, and I'll mention a couple of examples as we go on today. Uh, any other questions about this before I move on? No? Okay. Uh, and there are energetic starlight and cosmic rays again. Okay, so what are the big questions about gas that I want to talk about today? The first is, does the gas trace the dust? So yesterday we spent a while talking about how to measure masses of circumstellar disks using dust emission. And so the question that I want to start off with is, is that a smart thing to do? Because as we talked about yesterday, dust is only about 1% of the mass of the disk. So if you're going to make the assumption, if you're going to measure masses based on gas, then multiply by 100 to get the total mass of the disk, then uh, you'd better know that the gas and the dust trace each other and maintain this 10 to the minus 2 abundance throughout the whole disk. So that's the first thing we'll talk about. The second is how does chemistry affect planet formation? And here um, it's an incredibly complicated topic, multifaceted, complicated topic, but I'll talk about a few specific examples. I'll talk about uh, snow lines in disks and I'll talk about a couple of other specific molecules um, including some different deuterated species that provide insight into how different chemical reactions can affect the planet formation potential in these disks. The third thing that I'll talk about is how, did the, how does the gas move? So when we study circumstellar disks, we're often thinking about initial conditions for planet formation. And I talked a lot about that yesterday, right? Comparing the amount of material in the disk to the minimum mass solar nebula, do we have enough material for planet formation? How is it distributed through the disk? But there's another sort of dimension to the initial conditions for planet formation, which is the dynamical initial conditions. How is the material moving? What are the speeds with which material collides with each other in the disk? And is that promoting planet formation or inhibiting planet formation? So I'll talk a little bit about the motions that we observe in circumstellar disks, and in particular turbulence, and how we can compare that with different models of, of turbulence in, um, that you might get from some of the, the modeling that you guys are doing with these different codes. Uh, okay, and fourth, what is the deadline for giant planet growth? If you want giant planets to form, you'd better do it before the gas disk disperses. So we'll talk a little bit about gas disk dispersal and some of the interesting recent observations that are pointing towards maybe a later deadline for gas disk dispersal. 
And five, what can gas tell us about planets? So if I get to this point, we'll, co we'll go back to transition disks and talk about how um, gas observations can sort of disambiguate some of the questions about where transition disks come from and what are the physical processes uh, surrounding their evolution. Okay, so starting off with question one. Does the gas trace the dust? And we're going towards answering the bigger question of how good are disk mass estimates that use only dust? So I'll tell you a little bit of a story. Um, it's the story of similarity solutions. Doesn't that sound exciting? <laughs> I thought so, right? Um, okay, so this is a story that happened uh, maybe five or so years ago. So five or so years ago, people were making these relatively low resolution observations of gas and dust and trying to model them. So here's a typical gas observation. This is something called a position velocity diagram that radio astronomers love. And uh, it's really arbitrary which axis has position and which has velocity. So you have to look at them to, to be sure what you're looking at. But this is position and this is velocity. So as you look here, you can see that um, the disk extends to a diameter of about uh, this is six arc seconds either direction, so about 12 arc seconds across on the sky. So we knew that gas disks were, well, this is large for a circumstellar disk, right? These things tend to be pretty tiny. Gas disks are pretty large. They extend out to maybe 10 arc seconds for some of the closest, biggest disks. But if you look at the dust, so this is 1.3 millimeter continuum emission, which is very close in frequency. Uh, actually, it's not, but um, <laughs> it's, it's very close in frequency to the J equals 2 to 1 transition of CO, but um, they must have also observed this disk in the J equals 3 to 2 transition. Anyway, not important. The point is that if you look at these two images, this is a 12 arc second box. This is 12 arc seconds across. These are the same disk, but it looks like the gas extends to much larger extents on the sky than the dust. So people kind of rang their hands and said, well, I, I don't know, maybe it's just that our observations aren't sensitive enough to the dust. Because when you look in gas lines and you see this incredibly thick, optically thick CO, um, you can see it out to very great distances from the star. So they would model the gas disk and then use it to predict what a dust observation would look like. And here's what they got. So this is the dust model, actually the opposite, the dust model. Um, and they would say, OK, well, here's our dust disk. And we're going to now just uh, give it artificial wings that extend out to the size of the gas disk. What would that look like? And it's still not big enough to cover the 12 arc second box. So it seemed like there was a real size discrepancy here. And that's an important thing to know, right, if the size of your gas disk is a lot bigger than the size of your dust disk. So the thing that happened here is that Everybody had just uh, sort of always been using these power law models that were based on the minimum mass solar nebula that I told you about yesterday. So the power law models have an inner radius, they have a sharp cutoff at the outer radius, and then they have just some power law surface density as a function of radius. Actually, both surface density and temperature as a function of radius follow some power law form. But we know that that's artificial, right? We don't expect the outer parts of these disks to chop off instantaneously. Um, and in fact, we already know that there's a functional form that we expect these disks to follow. It's called, well, so what I'm going to call it here is a similarity solution. Um, it's based on the work of Lyndon Bell and Pringle in the 1970s and was applied to the particular problem of protoplanetary disks by Lee Hartman and collaborators around 1998. So we've known for a long time that we expect that as viscous disks evolve, they should spread out in this self-similar pattern where you have essentially a power law in the inner part of the disk, but then this exponentially tapered tail. And so um, a few years ago, I wrote a paper that said, hey guys, uh, if we use similarity solutions instead of power law solutions, we actually don't have this problem anymore. If we use the power law solutions to match the dust, then the gas is too small. But if we use the blue similarity solutions, we can match both the dust and the gas, and we can have these physical extents be the same. So OK, that seemed like a really good solution, right? And, um, and in fact, this caused similarity solutions to catch on in disk modeling throughout the field for a few years. Yes? Just so I understand, the, the dust really does extend all the way out to the end of the gas disk. It's just the, the radio observations aren't something that we're going to Exactly. Exactly. And so if you try to have that artificial chopping off, then you run into a problem with sensitivity. But with the artificial, ta but with the, the, the taper that we apply in the similarity solution, the dust just becomes essentially invisible as this tail starts. But because the gas is optically thick, you can see it out much farther than you can see the dust. Yes, exactly. Um, any other questions? Did I see a hand come up over here? No. OK. Um, yes. So the model 
model of the power law was applied only to the dust or also to the gas? Also to the gas. Yeah, so they would do one for the dust that chopped off at some radius and then one for the gas that chopped off at a larger radius. But they wouldn't make it be the same, the same radius. Right, and in fact, what I was trying to show you previously is if they tried to extend it out to the same radius, um, they got things that didn't match the observations. So there was no power law solution that could simultaneously match the dust and the gas. No single power law. You would have to have them cut off at different radii, and those radii were often different by a factor of two to four. So, so that was the problem. Yeah. Now, when you're using the similarity solutions, the radius where you start getting the exponential tail, is that also factor two different, or is that? Different? No. Now those can. So, in this example, these are identical. So, these are identical similarity solutions, right? This, uh, the um, characteristic radius here is something like um, it's a little bit smaller than the outer radius for the power law that I've marked here. It's maybe like one arc second. But because of the exponential tail, the disk actually exists much farther out. So if you were looking at where RC is on here, it would be like maybe here. And then um, you can see the disk about three times as far out as that. Uh, so this is, this is the same model that works for both the gas and the dust. So you can reproduce the dust over here. This is a, one of those terrible visibility plots like I showed you yesterday. Um, so you can reproduce the dust emission over here and then the gas emission over here. Now, there's more to this story, so don't think that this is the, the biblical handed down wisdom quite yet. So um, it seemed for a while like similarity solutions had solved the problem, and lots of people use them very successfully in modeling disks. But now, over the last year or two, we've entered a period where we've been able to have much higher sensitivity, and now we can go back and re-examine this and, and kind of check whether or not this is working. So now, um, the story has gotten more interesting. Uh, similarity solutions still seem to work for the majority of disks that we observe. However, there are a couple of interesting um, examples of places where they don't work anymore. So one of these is TW Hydra, which is the closest known gas-rich disk. It's only 50 parsecs away. So it's really our test case for a lot of these things because it's so close that it's extremely easy to observe. Um, 50 parsecs away compared to about 140 parsecs for the nearest big star-forming regions like Taurus and Ophiuchus. So here we've got some data. Uh, and we've got a bunch of different models, um, which are all the S means similarity solution. And these are basically similarity solutions of different size. And so you can see that model SA does the best job of reproducing the data. So we would expect that the dust would also look like that. However, here's model SA, the red, uh, compared with the dust. And so it doesn't work anymore. So uh, what this shows is that dust disks are actually, at least sometimes, smaller than gas disks, independent of the model you use. So we've sort of gone up to the next level of understanding. Before it was, well, we were using an inappropriate model. But now, when we, we can use the same model that was previously able to reproduce a lot of these gas and dust disks, and at least sometimes, the dust is actually physically smaller than the gas. And furthermore, the dust appears to have sharp edges. Not the gas, actually. So this is an interesting point. Um, in some cases, it seems like the dust actually chops off quite abruptly. And you can see that in the, in the um, interferometric data as this ringing that happens at long wavelengths. So it doesn't cross below zero. That might indicate a hole in the center of the disk. But this ringing where it goes a little bit down and a little bit up and a little bit down and a little bit up, that's indicative in Fourier space of a sharp edge in the data. So the dust seems to have a sharp edge, but the gas does not. So there's something that's carving out a sharp outer edge to the TW Hydra disk that makes it physically disparate from the gas that it's embedded in. Um, this probably doesn't affect the mass measurement much since we're worrying about how good are disk mass estimates that use only dust. And the reason for that is that about two thirds of the mass is in the inner part of the disk. And so you know, here we're talking about the outer edges where there's very little mass to begin with. Yeah. Oh, sure. Um, well, this is 50 parsecs away, so who's really good at math on their feet and is not me because I'm not? Um, I think the outer edge is at like 60 AU, something like that, uh, for the dust, and then the gas extends out to about 200 AU. Yeah. Um, okay. So this probably doesn't affect the mass measurement much uh, because it's only occurring in the outer regions of the disk. So that's good. We're safe as far as mass is concerned. But then the question is why? What causes this sharp outer edge? Uh, the tempting thing and the thing that people initially said was planets. Planets always cause sharp edges, right? Well, it's not always planets. Um, and in fact, now, uh, like I was mentioning yesterday, there's this idea that fragmentation and radial drift 
might actually uh, cause this fairly sharp edge in the dust that, um, that not only exists, but that changes as a function of grain size. So the prediction based on fragmentation and radial drift is that the larger the grains you look at, i.e. the longer the wavelength you go to, the smaller the outer edge will be, and it should be sharp at all of those different frequencies. And that indeed seems to be what we're seeing now that these observations are being followed up. I don't actually have a, a paper to show you yet because they're not out yet, but that is what seems to be happening. So just to give you sort of the cartoonish version of fragmentation, um, this is from Till Bernstiel's paper. He's now working with Sean Andrews, showing that this is the case, that you see this, um, this frequency dependent change in the outer radius of the dust disk for the TW Hydra system and one other system, HD163296. And so you can see there are various ways in which the grains can grow and then fragment down to small sizes. Um, this fragmentation barrier is very interesting, but I'm not going to describe it today because it's not related to observations directly. Um, but the fragmentation barrier uh, sort of keeps these grains small, and then you can see that um, if the fragmentation barrier is kind of up around this region here where the, the radial drift velocities are highest, it can cause the large grains to sort of zoom into the inner part of the disk. So any grains that are, are um, sort of in this meter size area, this is related to the meter size barrier problem in planet formation, are going to move in. And you can see that the larger the particle, the faster the radial velocity. So that's why the larger particles kind of get pulled into the inner part of the disk more quickly, leaving the smaller particles in the outer part of the disk. So the combination of fragmentation and radial drift sets up this size dependent, this grain size dependent uh, dust disk structure. OK, um, moving on just a little bit, uh, the other part of the question to ask is how good are disk estimates that use only dust or carbon monoxide? Like I told you already, carbon monoxide is only a part in 10 to the 4 of the total gas mass of the disk. So I was sort of disparaging mass estimates based on dust because they were only a hundredth of the mass of the disk. Well, these are even less than that if you, if you try to look at the most abundant tracer of gas that we can easily observe, the carbon monoxide, you do even worse than with dust in terms of fractional total mass. So the cool thing that's happened in the last year or so is that Herschel has been able to detect the HD molecule in disks. So here's another example of a way that deuterated chemistry is really important for helping us understand the properties of protoplanetary disks. So H2, hydrogen in a hydrogen, is the most abundant molecule, but replace some of those hydrogens with, um, with deuteriums, and you get an H and a D bonded together. And all of a sudden, it has a dipole moment, because now the two atoms in the molecule don't have the same mass anymore. So you can, you can get a dipole moment that can be measured with telescopes like Herschel. And so this is really exciting. So once again, TW Hydra, our, our nearest gas-rich neighbor, we've detected the HD molecule. And um, so previous mass estimates of this disk, based on dust, based on carbon monoxide, based on some of these different molecular tracers, gave a very, very wide range of masses, basically two orders of magnitude uncertainty in the mass of the disk. And now, using uh, the HD measurement, we've been able to improve the mass estimate so that it falls at basically the upper end of this range, um, 0.05 solar masses. This is about a half a solar mass star. Uh, so you can see that it's about 10% of the mass of the star. And that's about what we expect for these disks. That was about the median that I showed you in the, in the mass distribution yesterday. But um, still, it's nice to have this confirmation that the gas measurements are agreeing with some of the masses that have been estimated based on dust measurements. So that, that's a really nice um, way to tie this together. Uh, any questions? Yeah. Yeah, so the huge. Um, so some of these mass estimates are, made, are based on continuum emission. Some of the uncertainty comes from different assumptions about the mass opacity and the gas to dust ratio. Um, some of these estimates came from attempts to model different gas lines in the disk. So some of the optically thick and some of the optically thick CO transitions to try to build up a picture of the disk. Um, there are several different methods that went into that range of mass estimates. So which method, which method is best? Which method should you believe? Um, actually, I don't remember from this particular paper which one was responsible for the higher end mass estimates. But this number is consistent with actually two papers that I can think of off the top of my head for this particular disk. One is a dust estimate, and one is a, a gas 
modeling estimate. So um, probably there are uh, a couple of different methods that'll get you close to this, this good answer, um, but you have to be really careful about your modeling. And uh, so I know that's not a very helpful answer. So the, the main point to take away is that actually the dust mass estimates seem to be pretty good if you just make some simple assumptions and you look at the total continuum flux. It's probably not bad. It's probably OK to within an order of magnitude. What's that? Yeah, millimeter wavelength. So remember, like I said yesterday, you need to look at millimeter wavelength fluxes because that's where the disk becomes optically thin. You shouldn't believe mass estimates from any continuum fluxes shorter than millimeter wavelengths because there are a whole lot of modeling assumptions that have to go into it to account for the fact that the disks are optically thick at those wavelengths and so most of the mass is hidden. So you need to look at millimeter wavelength fluxes to understand the total mass from the disk. Any other questions? So this is sort of the end of uh, the segment on whether or not gas traces dust and um, whether mass estimates are believable. Um, and I think we're sort of converging on this answer that, yeah, basically looking at millimeter fluxes, total millimeter fluxes, and estimating the masses from the, based on those fluxes are not so bad. And now we have a bunch of different lines of, of um, kind of supporting evidence. The fact that the, the gas and the dust seem to trace each other pretty well, although we're making some edits to that now that we have really high, um, high sensitivity observations that are letting us see these subtle edges in the, the dust disks. Um, so that's something that uh, doesn't affect the mass measurements. So, so, I mean, the first order answer is that yes, to, to a pretty good degree of precision, gas and dust do in fact trace each other in disks. But in a few cases, the outer disks, there seems to be a little bit of decoupling. Um, so, so to first order, your estimates of the mass based on the continuum emission are pretty good. But we can also do better now with uh, molecules like HD. And those do seem to be consistent with the continuum measurements. So you're probably not doing so bad if you're using continuum measurements for your statistics. But there are ways to check now. And that's pretty great. Um, OK. So uh, question two, how does chemistry affect planet formation? And actually, I realized as I was writing this that a lot of the recent chemistry papers have been not directly about how chemistry affects planet formation as much as how can chemical tracers provide um, unique information about the planet formation process in these circumstellar disks. But the first thing I'll talk about is a very direct effect on planet formation, and that is the location of the snow line in circumstellar disks. So if you look at our solar system, right, um, we think that most of the planets in our solar system formed about where they are now. Probably there was a little bit of moving around, but it's not like we have hot Jupiters in our solar systems that definitely formed uh, far away from the star and migrated in. We think that this is sort of the initial configuration. And so historically, people have defined this snow or frost or ice line as, uh, as a sort of idea about why we have cold, rocky planets in the middle. And then all of a sudden, we get gas giant planets at some particular radius. This radius happens to correspond to approximately the location in the early solar system where the temperatures were low enough that volatiles like carbon monoxide and some of the other ices could condense into solid form on grains. And so if you look at the predicted surface density in the early solar system, the surface density of solids, right? It starts off, it decreases, and then there's this leap that's about a factor of four, um, somewhere in between the orbit of Mars and Jupiter in the early solar system. And then it follows the same power law as you go out again. And that leap in solids has nothing to do with dust. It's all about gas condensing into solid form onto the grains, right? So that increase by a factor of four allows you to build up cores that are large enough to accrete gas atmospheres, et cetera, et cetera. So the really cool thing is that now we're starting to be able to actually see these snow lines with direct observations in circumstellar disks. Um, and here's an example. So uh, this is the disk HD 163296. Um, actually, no, sorry, this is TW Hydra again. Uh, there are two papers by Charlie Chi. The one from 2011 deals with HD 163296, and 2013 is TW Hydra. So the 2011 paper, so first of all, you might say, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is a, this is a gas tracer, and now we're seeing lots of gas far from the star. That's exactly the opposite of what I said should happen with snow lines, where the gas should be in the inner part of the solar system and then should freeze out onto grains in the outer part of the solar system. So what you're seeing here is actually this is evidence of the CO snow line, because CO tends to destroy N2H+. And so once CO freezes out, N2H+, becomes more abundant. So by looking for places where you see N2H+, in a ring around the star like this, 
the inner radius of this ring should correspond to the place where carbon monoxide is freezing out onto dust grains in the midplane of the disk. So that's what we believe we're seeing here. And this is an ALMA observation that actually was made with free publicly available data that was released to the community. So this is some of the science verification observations that they took. So one of the really cool things uh, about ALMA is that they've released a lot of free data. So if you want to go dig through and look for interesting lines like this, you can actually do that. You can um, take the ALMA data yourself and search through them for interesting chemical species. And that's what Charlie did. Um, the other thing that's interesting, the reason why I cite the 2011 paper here too, is that the other approach that Charlie took is to, um, is to actually just model lots of different CO lines to take optically thick transitions, optically thin transitions, look at them all together, and try to derive a CO freeze out temperature and the location of the CO snow line. And he was actually able to do that in a different disk that also gave a consistent answer with what we're observing in this paper, that carbon monoxide does in fact freeze out at a temperature of about 19 Kelvin. So um, there was lots of lab evidence for that, but now we actually have observational ast astronomical evidence that that's really happening in these circumstellar disks. So the structure of the disk once again looks something like this, where this is height above the midplane and this is radius in the disk. And there's a, a warm molecular layer like I talked about before, where the top is, is photo dissociated and the bottom is frozen out. And so not only can you model carbon monoxide and find evidence for the location of these snow lines, but now we can use different molecular tracers that are sort of complementary to the carbon monoxide molecule to actually see direct evidence of snow lines and disks. Any questions about that? No? OK. Um, moving on, I'll do a little bit more chemistry. Uh, chemistry is not my field, so um, some of these things become very esoteric very quickly. But uh, I'll tell you about a couple of different interesting results recently. So CC3H2 as an excitation turbulence tracer. Um, this is something that people have been extremely excited about detecting in ALMA data because uh, this particular molecular tracer is sensitive to a whole bunch of things that are important for planet formation. Fractional ionization, which is really important for determining the amount of turbulence in the disk and the location of dead zones. Uh, the penetration depth of UV X-rays and UV photons. So um, basically, how deep are these energetic is this energetic radiation able to penetrate into the disk? And turbulent mixing, and I'll come back to turbulence later on. Um, so anyway, interesting molecular tracer. And uh, then this other one is, is about deuterium chemistry. So here are two different deuterated molecules. And the interesting thing about them, these are observations of the same disk, our old friend TW Hydra again. And uh, once again, this is, um, I believe this is more ALMA science verification data. And so free publicly available data. One of these is actually an SMA observation. I think this is an SMA observation and this is the ALMA science verification data. But anyway, what you're seeing here is that one of these deuterated species is centered on the star and the other is distributed in a ring around the star. And so the conclusion that they take away from these observations and a little bit of modeling work that goes along with it is that there are different pathways to deuteration in circumstellar disks, some of which operate at high temperatures close to the star and some of which operate at colder temperatures farther away from the star. So why is this important for planet formation? Well, people for years have been trying to relate um, deuteration abundances in different solar system objects to uh, the formation of planets. And so now we have to be very careful because we know that there are at least two different pathways by which the, the deuteration fractions, the, the deuterium fractionation, can change with radius in the disk. There are some things that make it more, um, more likely for some molecules in the center part of the disk, and for other molecules, it becomes more likely in the outer part of the disk. So we have to be really careful when we look at deuterium fractionation in solar system objects and try to use that as a way to understand planet formation. So this is sort of a cautionary tale about using deuterated molecules to relate to process that might have happened in the early solar system. Um, questions about that? Don't ask me too many questions about that because, like I said, I'm not a chemist. <laughs> um, all right. So now uh, let's start talking about how gas moves in the disk. So this gets more towards the dynamical initial conditions for planet formation. And this is something that is, this is a topic that is very near and dear to my heart. Um, and I'm, I'm on most of the papers that are in this section. So, OK, observing kinematic initial conditions for planet formation. So at least to first order, these disks are so Keplerian it hurts. I mean, when, when you make maps of these disks, when we make moment maps like this that show sort of the spider diagrams and circumstellar disks, 
they're incredibly, incredibly regular. I mean, if you look at this, if you took out sort of the, the little blobby outer line here, you would have a lot of trouble telling if this is data or a model. Um, there are actually some really nice ALMA observations where uh, I, I actually played this game. I didn't do it here. I did it in, a, in another talk that I gave a while ago where you can make um, a map of an ALMA observation of a disk and you can create a model of a disk and put them next to each other. And it's actually hard to tell which is the model and which is the data. Um, so it's really incredible. These things are very, very Keplerian. But the fact that we have so much sensitivity now means that we can start to look for deviations from Keplerian rotation that can tell us about how material in the disk is moving around and what its temperatures and densities are. So one of the neat things that you can do, once again, with free public science verification data from ALMA is, uh, this is Catherine Rosenfeld, who's a graduate student at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. So now we can look closer at the data. Once again, back to TW Hydra, everybody's favorite test case. Um, so here's what the data look like. And you've already seen a little bit about TW Hydra. So note that now we've got position on the y-axis and velocity on the x-axis. So the interesting thing here is, you know, the, the position of TW Hydra looks fine. But remember before, we saw that TW Hydra was sort of capped in velocity at about plus or minus two kilometers per second. And it's hard to see down here, but this is like six kilometers per second across. So once you have the sensitivity with all the data to look down to some of the faint emission, you see that it extends to incredibly high velocities on either side of the star. So why is that weird? Well, TW Hydra is oriented nearly face on. It has an inclination of only about five degrees to the line of sight. So to get material that's plus or minus six kilometers per second, it has to be incredibly close to the star, and the surface area that it should cover is so small that it ought to be invisible. So when you make a Keplerian model of a disk, here's a Keplerian model of the TW Hydra disk, you can see that it only extends about two-thirds of the way out to the maximum velocities that we observe in the disk. So what can you do to the disk? How can you tweak it to make those extremely high velocities? There are basically three options. One is you can make the material in the center of the disk incredibly hot, because hot material moves around faster, adds up more red shifts and blue shifts, and you get line wings. Um, so that's what you're seeing here. Hot material can give you broad line wings. The other thing you can do is just make the material move faster by giving it more turbulence. So if you enhance the turbulence in the center of the disk, stuff moves faster, you get lots more red shifts and blue shifts, and so you get these extremely extended line wings. Um, so that's another possibility. The third possibility is, like I said, the reason that the large velocities are unexpected in TW Hydra is because it's so face on. But we know that the outer part of the disk is face on, but what if you gave a twist to the inner part of the disk and you changed its inclination? Then the more you incline it, the more you'll see those velocities as it circles around the star. So another possibility is a warp that changes the inclination in the TW Hydra disk so it's higher than the inclination in the outer part of the disk. So, the thing about TW Hydra is that so far we haven't been able to spatially resolve this high velocity material, so we can't tell the difference between these three possibilities. But there are lots of ways to change the velocity structure of a disk, and this is really some of the first evidence that there are, in fact, deviations from Keplerian rotation in these circumstellar disks. And the fact that they're taking place um, in the high velocity central regions of the disk tells us that they could be extremely relevant for um, terrestrial planet formation. So we're talking about like a few AU from the star, similar to the location where we think Earth formed in the early solar system. So these processes that we'll, we'll hopefully learn more about as we gain more and more spatial resolution um, are probably going to be relevant to some of the terrestrial planet formation that's extremely hard to probe right now when we're limited to the outer part of the disk. Any questions about this observation? Yes. Could you add a wind? Could you add a wind? So um, it would have to be a molecular wind. Um, and uh, so sure, you know, I, I think the situation you're setting up, right, is you have this face on disk, but you send a wind out perpendicular to the disk, and that could give you higher velocity uh, material. So maybe you could add a wind, but I think uh, one of the issues is that it would have to be um, quite hot to produce uh, the CO emission that we're seeing at these high velocities. And um, the other uh, thing is that there's no, there's no other evidence for a wind in TW Hydra, at least not coming from the, the center of the disk. So um, I'm not sure what the implications would be for, for other observations that we would expect to show up in TW Hydra. It's an interesting point. Um, I'm not sure if Catherine thought about it in that paper or not. But yeah, um, another possibility might be a wind, sure. Yes? How does it change the, the output of the wind if you had a kind of um, pressure gradient? 
if you had a pressure gradient, um, what kind of a pressure gradient? Sure. Uh, pre uh, radial pressure gradient. Oh, sure. You mean from so gas pressure support? Yep. yep. I'm going to show a picture of that in just a couple of slides. Um, actually, I think the next slide is about how you expect the, the, um, the pressure gradient in the gas to cause um, material to deviate from capillary rotation. And the answer is not enough to, to show this kind of broadening in the line wings that we expect. It actually is more of an effect at uh, the larger radii, I think. But I'll show you in a second anyway. So. Um, Yes, good question. Any other questions before I move on? No? OK. So more incredibly gorgeous, incredibly free ALMA data over here. So this is the disk around HD163296. So um, this is really amazing stuff. So the previous slide I showed you was all position velocity diagrams. It was, it was mostly unspatially resolved, interesting stuff. But now we can see more spatially resolved, interesting stuff. So uh, here's that butterfly wing pattern that I showed you before. This is the high velocity wings that are coming from close to the star. And now we can see those butterfly wings. But instead of being just a single butterfly wing, you can see that they seem to have this sort of ghostly shadow behind them. Can you see that on this slide? Is it showing up well? Yeah. Um, so what's going on here? When these data came out, we were all like, whoa, this is incredible. And if you think about it for just a moment, it's pretty obvious that what we're seeing is the front and back of a flared disk. So these disks are flared, and you incline them a little. And you're seeing basically a, a top cone and a bottom cone rotating in the same direction. And so you can actually make a toy model of a cone rotating around the disk. So this is what a flat disk looks like. Um, if you make a cone that's sort of pointed down, you get something that angles a little bit below. So here's the major axis. And you can see that this one is bent a little bit towards the major axis. And this one is bent away from the major axis, just as you would expect for these uh, bottom cone and top cones. So you can see that you expect this sort of shadowy top and bottom of the disk to look like this. So we can actually see, this is, this is direct visual evidence of either a vertical temperature gradient or uh, probably, in addition, freeze out in the center of the disk. So there's, there's either um, very low temperatures that are making the center lane seem dark, or the CO has frozen out onto the dust grains. And we can't tell just from this observation, but based on modeling, it seems that a temperature gradient is sufficient to do that. And so uh, one thing that Catherine did is she worked on modeling these data. Now that we have incredibly high spatial resolution, you can do a lot of detailed modeling of the velocity structure. And one of the things she looked at is deviations from things like the pressure gradient, the vertical geometry of the disk. People have been very lazy in the past because we didn't have enough spatial resolution for it to matter and have just assumed a cylindrical Keplerian rotating disk. But that's not actually what happens, of course. Um, there are deviations based on the vertical geometry and pressure gradients. So you can see here, here's the answer to your pressure gradient question. These are deviations from pure Keplerian rotation. So it makes about a 5% difference, but only in the outermost parts of the disk. Um, sort of in the midplane and towards the center of the disk, we're talking about uh, consistent with Keplerian rotation or at the sort of plus or minus 2% level throughout most of the disk. But in the outer parts of the disk, it can make sort of a 5% difference, uh, self-gravity at about the 2% level, and all terms at about the 5% level. And so she was able to show that this actually substantially significantly, statistically significantly, improves uh, modeling the data if we add in these different terms. So we're now sensitive to velocities at less than the 5% level relative to the Keplerian level now that we have this great uh, high sensitivity and high spatial resolution. So that's really exciting now that we're able to, to look into these deviations from Keplerian rotation at the few percent level. That's something that we've never been able to do before. Um, so one of the things that people are really interested in and something that I'm very interested in is using this uh, high precision stuff that we get from the high angular resolution and high sensitivity with modern interferometers to try to constrain turbulence in these disks. So how have people tried to observe turbulence in the past? I'll give you a little bit of a history of turbulence observations. Um, one is just through accretion rate measurements. So you know that if you can have a sense of how much material is falling in onto the star, you can relate that back to sort of what kind of an alpha do you need throughout the whole disk averaged over the radial, um, the radial extent of the disk to sort of feed that accretion flow onto the star. Okay. So if you make an accretion rate measurement and you think you know how much material is falling onto the star as a function of time, then you can sort of make a model of the disk and then back out an average alpha and an average, um, and an average amount of turbulence that you would expect in the outer part of the disk. 
So that's fine, but it's very model dependent, and it's also um, a problem that you, you know, right, intuitively, you know that the amount of material falling onto the star right next to the star is not going to tell you much about what's going on in terrestrial planet forming regions or in the outer parts of the disk, right? You have no radial information whatsoever. So that's a limitation of the accretion rate measurements. Also, of course, they're very model dependent. Um, so another thing that people have tried to do is to take unresolved spectral lines, like the row vibrational lines that come from the middle of the disk. This is, once again, carbon monoxide. This is carbon monoxide bandhead emission. And they try to, to take these uh, bandhead observations and fit a Keplerian disk to them. And they find that they can't, that the, the problem is the bandheads are too wide in velocity space. So they say, OK, our Keplerian model isn't working. So now we have to add some amount of velocity width to the line. And that extra velocity, that non-thermal, non-rotational velocity, we're going to call turbulence. And so this is pretty neat because in the, it's showing that in the inner parts of the disk, um, there seems to be roughly transonic turbulence, so turbulence at approximately the sound speed in the innermost parts of the disk. So that's a really cool result. Um, it has various uh, consequences for planet formation and observations of circumstellar disks in the future. Um, the problem with this is that First of all, um, you're still pretty model dependent because in order to, uh, to subtract off rotation and temperature, you need to think that you understand rotation and temperature. And those are sort of uh, spatially dependent quantities, right? You need to know the exact inclination of the disk. You want to know how temperature varies as a function of radius in the disk. And that's very hard. You have to, you have to make an estimate of where this, this line emission is arising from because, of course, the, um, this CO bandhead emission is only excited in the inner parts of the disk where the temperatures are high enough to excite this particular transition. So it only comes from one part of the disk, and it's still kind of model dependent. So while it's a very exciting result, it also still has limitations. You'd really like to know, as a function of radius in the disk and as a function of height above the midplane, how the velocities are varying. So for that, you have to have a molecular tracer that's spatially resolvable and that extends across the whole disk and isn't only excited in the inner parts of the disk. So people have looked to millimeter observations for a number of years. And um, people have been fitting models to low-res uh, low resolution, low spectral resolution carbon monoxide spectra since the late 1990s. So you might think that this is an answered question, right? We've had these observations since the late 1990s. Don't we know everything there is to know about turbulence by now? And of course, the answer to that question is no. Uh, the real problem with the millimeter observations from the, um, from the last kind of 20 years or so, well, there are a couple of problems. But one of the main ones is that the spectral resolution of the observations was about, uh, was kind of a factor of two or three or even approximately equal to the, um, the turbulent line width that was predicted for the outer parts of the disk. So of course you know that it's, it's always dangerous to look for an effect that is at the spectral resolution of your instrument or at the spatial resolution of your instrument, right? If something is only marginally resolved, it can be very hard to convince yourself that you've detected it. So uh, for a number of years, it was impossible to get down below that spectral resolution. And it was actually simply a, um, a software issue uh, in some of these millimeter wavelength interferometers. So a few years ago, well, partly it was a software issue, partly it was a hardware issue. But a few years ago at the submillimeter array, um, they introduced a new high spectral resolution correlator mode that allowed us to finally resolve about an order of magnitude down below the, um, <clears throat> the line widths that were expected for these turbulent processes and disks. And so that's something that I was working on a few years ago, where we actually have now this incredibly high spectral resolution data where we get position, position, velocity cubes at about a tenth of the widths expected for these turbulent line widths. So we can actually now resolve turbulence spectrally in these disks. And so through various modeling processes that you're welcome to ask me about, but I otherwise won't go into much detail about. Um, the, the tools that I use are mostly Raytran and Lime, and then comparing to radio transfer models developed by Paolo D'Alessio, um, as well as just uh, totally variable parametric models that we also used, we were able to derive a turbulent line width that was about 40% of the local sound speed for one disk, and an upper limit of about 10% of the local sound speed for another disk. So of course, the challenge here is disentangling turbulence from all of the other sources of broadening in these disks, from rotation, from thermal broadening, even optical depth broadening plays a role. So that's why you have to be really careful and do the radiative transfer very well. Um, but uh, you know, we're pretty confident we did it a bunch of different ways, and, and we were getting consistent answers with multiple different modeling methods. And so now we're pretty sure that we've detected turbulence in these disks. And of course, other groups have been working on this as well. Uh, here's a result from the French group from the year after our paper that uses uh, CS as a turbulence tracer in the disk. 
So why CS? I've been focusing exclusively on carbon monoxide, but one of the issues with carbon monoxide is that because it's optically thick, you're only seeing the surface layers of the disk. That only tells you about turbulence in the upper part of the disk. The other issue with carbon monoxide is that um, it's a pretty light molecule. So its thermal line widths are quite large. So going to a heavier molecule like CS means that the thermal line widths are small, so proportionally, turbulence is a larger fraction of the thermal line width and therefore easier to detect. So uh, they carry out a similar analysis and they actually get quite a similar answer to what we got. Of course, they're looking at a different disk, but um, they similarly get a turbulent line width of about a tenth of a kilometer per second, which is approximately what we measured in the HD163296 disk. So now there seems to be a little bit of momentum in this sort of observation where we're getting evidence that we're actually now detecting and resolving turbulence in some of these systems. And that turbulence is, is important, of course, as you know, for a number of reasons because it controls the accretion flow through the disk, so it ultimately controls the amount and spatial distribution of mass in the disk. Turbulence is important in planet formation, uh, possibly promoting planet formation by allowing solids to, to collect in high pressure regions or inhibiting planet formation by um, um, increasing the relative velocities and causing things to collide and fragment. So understanding the amount and spatial distribution of turbulence in the disk is really an important input to a lot of models of planet formation. Uh, I think that's all I had to say about turbulence, yes. Does anyone have any questions about turbulence observations in these disks? How am I doing on time? Okay, yes? The turbulence measurements agree, you know, up the yeah, good question. Um, so the answer to that is yes. Uh, there's some ambiguity about how to connect um, accretion rate measurements. So, so right, when you have an accretion rate measurement and you relate it to the mass transfer through a disk, um, you're essentially arguing about this parameter alpha that is in the shakira Sunayev formal formalization of, of accretion disk structure. Um, and there seems to be some discussion in the community about whether you expect turbulent velocities themselves, right? A turbulent velocity isn't easy to relate to an alpha. We measure something in kilometers per second and then you have to relate that to some like viscous efficiency essentially where you know alpha is, uh, um, so the viscosity is what like alpha times the, um, times the scale height times the sound speed, right? So you think about these turbulent motions and the maximum speed they can have roughly is the sound speed and the maximum height they can have roughly is the scale height of the disk. So alpha is sort of the efficiency factor, but you don't know how it's distributed between the two. Um, and so, uh, so when we compare with some of the theoretical models that they, uh, you know, the models pin down alpha and we pin down the line width. So the question is, do we think that the line width should be alpha times the sound speed or do we think it should be root alpha times the sound speed? And those can make an order of magnitude difference in the answers. But um, basically, yes, we're kind of in the same order of magnitude ballpark as, as sort of some of the, the um, understanding that was gained from accretion rate measurements and from simulations of alpha in the disks. So we're, we're approximately where we thought we'd be, which is good. Yeah. Um, what's the, the resolution of the velocity? So uh, in the in the so this one is a little bit lower. This the resolution of the velocity is um, I think I don't remember from this paper exactly, but it was slightly less than a tenth of a kilometer per second, I think. And our measurements from the 2011 paper were uh, 40 meters per second. Yeah, so that was the spectral resolution. So the velocity resolution was 40 meters per second, and the effects that we wound up measuring was something like a couple of tenths of a kilometer per second. So we're talking almost an order of magnitude difference there. And what about the spatial resolution? Yeah, so the spatial resolution is a really interesting issue. So the spatial resolution, as you might tell from these observations, is still relatively low. And um, that could be a problem because even the Keplerian shear across a spatial resolution element, when we have a spatial resolution of sort of 50 to 100 AU, the Keplerian shear across that spatial element is actually quite large compared to the, the effects that we're trying to measure. So that's a, that's a danger there. And so one of the things that we want to do in the future is push to higher spatial resolution so that we can actually, you know, we want to minimize 
all other sources of velocity width in the calculation. So now we've minimized the spectral resolution, but we still haven't minimized um, just sort of the, the change in velocity across the spatial resolution element. So that's a very astute point that you're making, is that the spatial resolution in our observations is still quite large, and that's something that we need to improve in the future for sure. Yeah, any other questions? OK. So let's move on to question number four. What is the deadline for giant planet formation? So yesterday I showed you a plot that looked very much like this. Uh, well, not exactly like this, but similar to this in the sense that as a function of age, we're looking at how many disks have measurable gas abundances. So this is actually an H2 observation. This comes from the very excited gas in the very center of the disk. You can't actually see some of those quadrupole transitions at high energy. And so um, the dust is much better characterized. Here we only have, instead of, um, like I showed you before, where it was cl averages for different clusters, we only have individual observations of disks at a few different ages that give us upper limits out here and gas measurements out here. So it's really a terrible plot, right, where they've drawn a trend line through here, but some of these are upper limits, some of these are lower limits on, on age. Like, we don't even know how old this star is, and we don't know how much gas there is in it. But this is really the best we can do for gas at the moment. So this plot can tell you that, well, you know, if we were guessing maybe the age is consistent with the dust age, which, remember, was around 10 million years, although also remember that both of these plots had the, have the now revised x-axis, where you should multiply this stuff all of these ages you should multiply by about a factor of two. But this plot is, is sort of comparable to the plot that I showed you yesterday in the sense that things seem to dissipate on approximately the same time scale, although the data are really, really quite pathetic right now. Um, so the Herschel GASP survey was designed to remedy this, although I've heard rumors that basically what the Herschel GASP survey is ultimately going to tell us is that Basically, all of the stars in Taurus have a lot of gas, and all of the stars in other clusters have no gas. So that's also not particularly helpful for constraining the age, but um, word on the street is that that, that might uh, be what happens with the Herschel gas survey. Um, so we would like to understand gas dissipation timescales in disks, but it's incredibly difficult because it's hard to survey large numbers of disks and measure their gas masses. So uh, that's something that ALMA should be able to do with time, and um, so that's something to look forward to with ALMA observations. So there's a whole other category of disks, though, that, um, that feed into this discussion of what is the dissipation time scale for gas disks. And these are extremely unusual disks. There are only, depending on how you count, there are only three or four that we know of now, and we only knew of one as of a couple of years ago. So th this is a very new topic of study that I'm about to tell you about. So as I mentioned yesterday, uh, the sort of typical picture is that with protoplanetary disks, we have lots of both gas and dust left over from star formation. And then the gas and dust disappear at an age of about 10 million years, maybe multiply that by two, so now it's 20 million years. And then there's debris dust only after that. Um, but as I hinted at yesterday, we're sort of starting to revise this picture where debris disks might no longer be so gas free as we first thought. So what's this then? Here is an A star. This is our stellar photosphere, just like I showed you yesterday, surrounded by a dusty disk. But if you were a connoisseur of spectral energy distributions for young stars, you would look at this and immediately say, this is a debris disk. And the reason that you would do that is because, I don't know if you remember I showed you yesterday, the, um, the sort of cartoonish model that I showed you had more of a flattened uh, SED up here, and it had a little silicate feature, and then it fell off at lower wavelengths. So if you were to put these side by side, you would see that the, um, the luminosity of the dust is several orders of magnitude lower, which tells you that there's a lot less dust. And actually, if you looked at it, you could estimate its optical depth and say, OK, this dust should be optically thin. And that's what a debris disk looks like. Protoplanetary disks are optically thick. And um, if you were to model its structure, you'd say, OK, well, there's just a cold, optically thin ring orbiting far from the star. And that's what we expect a debris disk to look like. So we basically separate out debris disks and protoplanetary disks in terms of their dust properties by their optical depth. If they're optically thick, we call them protoplanetary. If they're optically thin, we call them debris disks. So this is very clearly in the debris disk category. And in fact, it's comparable in its amount of dust to Beta Pictoris, which is a, a famous debris disk. This is 49 SETI, however. So debris disks are dusty, right? So, but this one still has a lot of molecular gas. This is actually quite an old measurement from um, Bill Dent's 2005 survey now, 
where you actually see this double peak structure that we expect for Keplerian rotating disk, and there's still a ton of molecular gas here. So what on earth is this thing? It looks like a debris disk in terms of its dust properties, but it still has a substantial quantity of orbiting molecular gas. Well, you can call it what you want, but I like to call it a horse of a different color. Um, anyway, horse of a different color. Is that not an international enough reference for this crowd? <laughs> Anyway, so it's, it's very different, right? Um, a horse of a different color is something that's completely different from anything we've ever seen before. And so this, this was true. This was the first one we found was 49 SETI. But since then, there have been a couple of others observed. Uh, this is HD21997, which is one of the early ALMA observed disks, um, which has now been observed in both gas and dust. And Beta Pictoris, famous debris disk. We knew that it had a little bit of gas in it, um, but now it's actually been observed in emission. This is a, a submitted paper um, based on a project led by Bill Dent that shows that we can actually see the beta pic gas disk in emission, and there's still a substantial quantity of carbon monoxide orbiting the disk. Now, the age of 49 SETI, the first star that I showed you, uh, well, what would you expect it to be, right? You would expect it to be less than 20 million years if it still has all this gas, but it's actually about 40 million years. Yeah. Yes, you should. You should absolutely be surprised that this is so asymmetric. This is one of the interesting results that come out, comes out of this paper. We have basically never seen a gas disk this asymmetric before. This is the first one that we've ever seen that's this asymmetric. And so a lot of the machinations in, in talking about this particular paper were about, well, what do we say about this asymmetric gas disk? What could possibly be causing this amount of asymmetry in the disk? And the jury is still very much out on that. Any other questions about the gas disks? Yes? How far out is the feature? How far out is the feature? Oh, good question. Um, well, I can tell you in terms of arc seconds. <laughs> uh, well, beta pic is about 10 parsecs away, and this is about, um, well, so the whole disk is about nine arc seconds across, so this is probably three or four arc seconds away from the star. So what's that, 40-ish AU? Something like that. So it's pretty far out there. And the other thing to keep in mind is that actually all three of the stars that I've shown you so far are A stars. And A stars have very intense high energy radiation fields. So they should photo dissociate CO. Um, yes? Ah, a filament in a cluster. Um, oh, sure. So. Um, I think the answer to that is no, and the reason for that is that, uh, so there are other disks that actually do line up with CO filaments. One of the ones that I've worked on in the past is HR8799, which has the four planet system. So it's actually associated with a CO filament. And so one of the magical things about interferometers is that if there's large diffuse gas, then, it w then they'll spatially filter it out and they, the large diffuse gas becomes essentially invisible. And that's what happens in the case of HR8799, where when you observe it with a single dish telescope, you can see this kind of filament snaking across the sky. And the the problem is that when you go and observe it with an interferometer, because it's relatively large and diffuse compared to the circumstellar structures, you essentially wash out all of that structure and you don't see it anymore. And so that's not the case in Beta Pictoris. And furthermore, if you look at the velocities associated with the gas in the Beta Pictoris disk, it's consistent with stellar rotation, with the Keplerian velocity that you would expect for the material rotating around the star. And furthermore, it lines up spatially with the plane of the dust disk. So you look at the dust disk, and interestingly, it's not exactly the same. It seems to be tilted up a little bit from the dust disk, inclined just slightly from the dust disk, but only by a couple of degrees. So it basically stretches out like the dust disk, but is actually maybe slightly inclined in the direction of the warp that's caused by the Beta Pictoris planet. So there's lots of crazy stuff going on in this system, but it does seem to be confined to circumstellar material instead of interstellar CO filaments. Um, any other questions? Yes? Oh, sorry, I thought I had more time. Yes, okay, I'm done. <laughs> um, okay, anyway, so the question is, is the gas primordial or second generation? Is it a disk that's refusing to grow up like Peter Pan, or is it second generation evaporating comets? And um, the jury is still out, because if you look at this disk, it has a continuous CO disk that looks like a primordial disk that's just been sticking around. But then, uh, so in this system, in this paper, they sort of favor the primordial disk explanation. But then if you look at the CO in the Beta Pictoris disk and you calculate the lifetime of the CO in the, um, in the uh, photo evaporating um, high energy radiation field, the lifetime of the disk is 120 
years with no prefix, not kill years, not mega years, years. So because this disk should disperse in a, um, in a century, uh, we don't think that there's any chance that it could be primordial material. So stay tuned for more information in this really, really interesting discussion about where the uh, gas in debris disks is coming from. And so if you guys are looking for projects, I think this is a really exciting area that has very little theoretical attention being paid to it so far. And with that, I will just wrap up by skipping my last section and saying the ALMA Cycle 2 deadline is this fall. And Cycle 2 will be incredibly powerful. And so if you are working on simulations and you think you have interesting effects, please, please, please put in proposals. We need more theorists working on ALMA. And if you're interested but potentially intimidated, I love talking to people about technical feasibility and helping to write out technical justifications for ALMA proposals. So I'm happy to help people in this audience with uh, technical justifications for ALMA proposals. OK, let's go have lunch. Thank you. <laughs>